In this Q&A we're going to be looking at depth of field effects and how to uh, improve on the quality. Okay, uh, the standard one that we actually have with Scanline is this multiple pass effect here which for us to enable it we can just have a look exactly what the kind of result we're going to get. So we're basically using a multiple path, uh, multiple pass method that the camera simply rotates around a uh, almost a circle or a star shape even uh, around this particular point to try and get a, um, uh, a focusing effect on the actual target or wherever we actually decide to specify the target distance within this parameter over here. Now the issue is um, if I go to do a preview again you can see that just maximize that there we go. Um, you'll see that we have uh, passes and overlaps of each sample over here. Uh, this is obviously derived within this total passes value here. Um, if we increase that obviously up to 50 it's going to smooth out quite a lot but obviously takes a lot longer to obviously produce. Now obviously this is in a viewport so it doesn't obviously take that long to actually produce however when it actually comes to render time um, don't forget each single pass each um, one of these guys needs to be rendered out in its entirety and then added together by the render at the end so uh, bear that in mind if you decide to use this multiple pass method. Um, personally I would steer away from it quite simply because it takes so long to produce. If you actually want a heavier depth of field effect we can increase the sample radius, let's increase up to see a value of 10 and just perform another preview and you'll see a huge amount of depth of field here however we're starting to see these banding issues all over again. Um, our central uh, screw here which is where the uh, uh, camera target is is quite close, uh, sorry it's quite in focus quite simply because the target is very close to the screw. Um, however all the other stuff in the background is obviously going to be out of focus. Um, for us to get rid of this banding effect we're still going to have to increase this total passes up even higher. Let's put this all the way up to 200 and then perform the preview all over again. You can see it's uh, trying to produce all of these banding issues. Uh, we just lost it. Let's try it one more time. Oh, no, it's maxing out, so <laughs> take that down to 100. Okay, there we go. So, again, we've still got some of these banding issues, and also don't forget the actual method of it producing the blur is this almost circular shape. We've got a few um, indentations in the camera path when, when it actually produces this step of the field effect. However, it's not perfect. It doesn't actually represent a well, a true lens effect. Now we have a few other methods that we can use to actually produce a decent depth of field effect. Uh, one is by uh, switching across to mantle ray. So if we just change the actual renderer itself, and just pull this down so we can see what we're doing. Here we go. Wait for that to update, and um, we can simply change this depth of field to mantle ray, and that gives us an additional parameter up here, which is basically our f stop value, which obviously can also be corresponded and overridden in this guy down here. Here we go. So all of these parameters can obviously be changed. We can have the basic within focus limits or f-stop values, uh, determine the focus plane and the f-stop for the blurring and so on. However, again, the same problem lies. Um, it's not exactly a realistic result. Obviously, the actual quality is going to be considerably better than this multiple pass method, and it's obviously going to take less time to render. However, the end result is going to be slightly, slightly blurred. It's going to be slightly Gaussian effect almost. Uh, you might see some kind of radial blooms but that's pretty much about it. You won't get the actual uh, defined lens shape and anything that's actually out of focus in the background. Um, a nice way around this is to utilize a shader that is actually hidden um, by default. It actually comes with metal ray however it's actually turned off because I don't think Autodesk have actually gone through the full um, 
R&D process to actually get it all approved, etc. So um, use this at your own risk. I have to say that right now. Um, if your machine goes bang or anything, I can't or 3D World can't be held responsible. So this is off your own back, okay? Um, so anyway, the shader is actually located within the um, program files or Autodesk Max 2009. I'm obviously using the 64-bit version of Max. Uh, otherwise, it'll be in the program files x so x86 folder, and then in the max folder, etc. So, program files max 2009 or max 2010, depending on which version you're using. Mental Ray shaders standard, and then in the include folder, you want to open this architectural max mi file. I would actually recommend you copy it first, label it as a backup or relocate a copy elsewhere on your drive just in case this goes wrong and you edit the thing incorrectly um, just so you've got a backup to start with. All right. So what you want to do is you want to close Max and open up that folder and open up this file which is the architectural Max MI file like I say and then just simply just do a find for Boker, B-O-K-E-H okay you'll find two one is basically commented out at the top here which is a comment in the history list by zap and if you go to next you'll be able to find this next guy here so what you'll see is this GUI uh, GUI MIA lens bokeh statement opening and then by default this will be looking like that so what you simply want to do is just add in a hash symbol which is that guy there, which in essence is going to comment out this uh, hidden statement. Okay, so then all you need to do then is just save and then restart Max. And then you can simply just drop in the lens shader. I'm just going to get rid of that glare. Just pull it in and you'll see this new one appear. Okay, so it's the arc, depth of field, bokeh effect. So you want to add that into the lens camera shaders. And if you want to access the actual parameters of this guy, we simply just need to instance it across to a free material slot. Okay, before we actually start amending some of these values, I just want to go through uh, each one and just describe what each one does. So the enabled one obviously allows you to turn it on and off. Uh, I mean, you can obviously do that within this... Uh, uh, renderer lens option here. You can obviously turn it on and off there or you can turn it on and off within the actual shader itself. Now this focus plane is basically the uh, area which is actually in focus. In essence it's the actual distance from the camera. So I'd actually use the same uh, target distance that you've derived in here. So I'll drop that in, in a bit. Um, that's a lot easier to obviously be able to sort it out within the scene so wherever the actual target is, uh, itself is uh, the obviously the area is actually within uh, within focus um, to make things easier if you decide to actually animate the position of the target distance either through the viewport uh, camera target or through uh, if you're using a, a free camera um, what you can do is wire using parameter wiring this value to this value here so therefore whatever uh, value you change here it changes here and so on so it makes things a lot easier at the end of the day without having two separate values uh, that are independent all right next thing is the redis of confusion now that's basically the size of the iris i.e the actual amount of uh, the actual size of the thing that uh, allows the light to pass through into the you know, so-called lens uh, it's not actually the size of the aperture it's basically the actual size of the distance between the aperture blades all right. The the higher the values, i.e., the larger the radius of confusion, the more exaggerated the depth of field effect will be. Uh, that in turn spreads out the number of samples. So therefore, this default value four is more than likely going to be too low. Um, I would personally amend this value to uh, basically a factor of two. Like for example, uh, for a sixteen thirty two sixty four one two eight two five six etc. So therefore, uh, the more samples that you obviously dial in the better quality you're actually going to get however the longer it's going to take to render the more you actually start dialing these values up all right uh, the next value is this bias now that basically pushes between um, 
in essence between the center of the actual blur and the exterior so for example if you're using a blade count to zero which obviously you are here um, blade count to zero by the way actually make sure that the actual um, end depth of field effect is basically a circle it's a true circle so therefore your bias if you're pushing it between say for example a value of drops all the way down to 0.1 and drops all the way up to a value of 10 um, pushes it between the center of the effect and the exterior so therefore we want a kind of uniform effect so therefore I wouldn't recommend you actually change this value unless you actually want some seriously defined outlines all right uh, next thing is the blade count and that's obviously how many blades are actually within the aperture itself so zero like I say is uh, gonna have well uh, a true circle so it's basically just one going all the way around um, then we can obviously increase this all the way up to well, up to a value of 12 um, I'd recommend for nice kind of defined effects a value of around about five five between five and eight I'd say um, I don't think you really need to push it any further otherwise you're starting to um, lose the kind of defined outlines and the end result starts looking a little bit like it's got a blade count of zero the blade angle simply just amends the actual uh, angle of which the uh, the blade is oriented so therefore um, you can obviously increase this between a value of zero and one to, to in essence to get it to pivot independently okay uh, the next option is to use a custom bokeh map now that allows you to actually use a externally referenced file like for example um, any kind of defined pattern like for example in this particular example I'm using a I'm going to be using a love heart later on to illustrate it so uh, we can go through and start tweaking that uh, once we've done some test renders okay so with the uh, multiplast effect turned off within the uh, within the camera because obviously we don't want to duplicate the amount of a uh, um, depth of field twice um, what we can now do is let's just do a quick test render now I'm using a HDR uh, light source that comes with the actual software so it's just a simple uh, desk LRG HDR file so if I just quickly just check out a single frame on that we'll see that the number of samples gives us slightly out of focus slightly grainy effect going on here it's not looking too bad however I think what I'll do just to illustrate this um, further is to actually increase the amount of samples and also amend the value of the radius of confusion and also the focus plane now the focus plane I want to set to uh, the same value as what it was in the viewport sample so that's going to be this 54.024 value so I'm just going to chuck that in there and that's going to pull focus to closer to the um, this region around here so if I chuck that out again you see the focus change now obviously these values are totally um, animatable so therefore you can obviously pull focus and um, do whatever you want within the actual render itself okay so that's not looking too bad we're starting to see some defined shapes here however like I say I think what we'll do is increase this radius of confusion which is obviously the size of the uh, iris I'm just going to put that up to a value of 3 and now you'll see the depth of field effect be considerably more exaggerated so we're starting to see some really large patterns here however obviously we're getting some serious sampling issues here now so obviously what we need then need to do is to increase the amount of samples proportionally so I'm just going to cancel that and I think what I'll do is I'll just increase that up to a value of 32 however the actual render time is going to increase quite considerably even though it should now help smooth things out a little bit and we should start seeing some um, circular shapes quite simply because the blade count that we're using obviously is a value zero so here we go we're starting to see these 
circular circular shapes here. I think what I'll do is I'll I'll, I'll take this down to about a value of two, so we're getting less grain. But I'm also going to set this blade count to a value of five. So now we start seeing some defined lines within the actual bokeh effect. As it catches up, here we go. Yeah, starting to see some lines here. Again, still got some um, sampling issues. I think what we'll do is we'll improve on that when it actually comes down to it. However, I think we'll just push on. So the next thing I want to look at is uh, this bokeh map. So what I've done is, as I mentioned within the actual text of the article, we can simply use a um, template. So what I've done is I've created a, a little heart-shaped bitmap, which is this guy here. So all of our bokeh effects should be like nice little uh, love hearts if I decide to actually enable this. There we go. Let's try that again. So all of our out of focus effects should now be having these little love hearts scattered around the image, which is a nice kind of trick and quite tacky, but <laughs> still quite good. Um, okay, the other thing to actually try is if you want to create some kind of chromatic aberration effects, for example, what you can also do is um, add in like three color split, for example, in here, like you have red, green, blue, um, just as kind of like a, a pyramid or diamond shape almost within the center here, and that will create some kind of color offsets within within the uh, within the pattern. So if I quickly just pause this and do you another one and then I'll show you exactly what I mean. Okay so what I've done is I've created this five sided so one two three four five sided uh, object with a kind of color, color wheel in the center. So if I duplicate or clone this image and then let's load in this other bokeh map and then re-render this guy. We'll start seeing some kind of heavy uh, colour offset going on. Let's just let this pass through. So we'll start seeing some colour offsets and so on and so on. So it's a nice little effect to do. It kind of offsets the uh, the, the color palette and creates these kind of cool effects. But again, our sampling quality is way too low, so we're starting to see this pixelation going in here as well. But you, you'll uh, start seeing the uh, end result quite shortly. Okay, I think we'll just pause that right now and just increase that again just for the fun of it maybe take that down to about 1.5 okay the uh, render time's obviously taking a little bit while but yeah we're starting to see these nice smooth there we go smoother even areas around here it's working quite well okay so Anyway, that's uh, pretty much the end of this Q&A. Um, one slight additional disclaimer that I want to add at this particular time. Um, if you are working on a production, or if you're working within a production environment, or even if you're just doing it for yourself, um, this method is very destructive. What I mean by that is that the actual end result, this bokeh or depth of field effect, is going to be baked into the render. For you to be able to change this uh, after it's actually been rendered is going to be nigh impossible. So therefore, my best suggestion to you is to actually render out separate depth of field passes, like for example using the Z-depth uh, pass, Z-depth buffer, um, coming out of Max, and then sort out all of this kind of effect, sort out all this um, depth of field effect within a compositor, be it combustion, toxic, um, digital fusion, whatever, 
Um, there are a fair amount of filters out there. If they're not standard within the package, there are a fair amount of filters that you can either purchase or there's trials that you can actually download and have a go with uh, to create this kind of effect. Um, that will therefore obviously allow you to be able to tweak this um, effect on the fly and also give you a lot more control and obviously not affecting your long time consumer, long long time spent uh, heavy render. Okay, so obviously the uh, individual frames obviously taking considerably longer to take to render than the actual standard beauty render without the depth of field effects. So obviously bear that in mind, it's all about uh, time and um, control at the end of the day. So with that in mind, I uh, hope you've enjoyed this and hope you've uh, got a bit of an insight into some of the uh, hidden features within Max and I'll see you on the next one. Cheers.